Hi everybody, this is James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, and I am starting up my next uh, little broadcast. Just everything ready. I apologize. Um, I hope everyone's having a good Saturday night. Uh, I had a great day today. I had a group session through Second Chance in Life. They had uh, set up a whole bunch of uh, group sessions in the month of October, so that their uh, their families, their adopters, could come and uh, find out some issues that they were having with some of their skittish dogs that happened and they're coming in from um, Taiwan a lot of times those dogs that come in from countries where they're the uh, uh, the perspective on animal cruelty is uh, is not even very much understood because the low education that occurs in those countries uh, of the people who do do uh, uh, cruelty onto animals onto dogs and so forth like that really don't have a uh, grasp of what things are happening and so it's a little bit tough um, to do that so anyhow I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about that group session that I had it was great um, in the sense that there are people there who have dogs that are skittish uh, and some people have been to other trainers as well and they're finding that the questions that they have are not being answered and a lot of that is a root psychological issue of their dog and uh, like I said the other day, a lot of times people will say things, uh, they go, you know, they hire somebody and then the person will say, you know what, your dog's fair reactive, your dog's this, your dog is that, your dog is uh, skittish, etc. And the biggest thing what we want to do is we want to find out why is the dog skittish. And a lot of times it has to do with a more deeper uh, uh, evaluation of the dog's psychological issues. And, and like I said, the, uh, as I always say, um, it's important to know what the psychological issues are because we can't just define something with a generality. We can't just say because a dog is skittish, we can't go and say, your dog is skittish and, oh, hey, Monica. Uh, hey, Henry. Hey, Monica, um, I, I forgot to, I didn't realize that uh, tomorrow's session uh, group is not happening. Uh, uh, Grace told me about that and I apologize because I was, I was all ready for it, so I apologize, Monica. Um, so anyhow, what I want to talk about the fact is that uh, when you go see a trainer, what is the definition of your dog's issues? The only reason we go see a trainer, other than for obedience, etc., you know, trick training, obedience, agility, etc., it's behavioral. Our dog is reactive, our dog is scared, our dog is aggressive, our dog is dangerous. All these generalities, we need specifics aligned to that. We can't just speak about it in just the, the, the cloud aspect of, oh, you know, aggressive we want our trainer we want to demand more from our trainer we want to demand more from our behaviorists because you're paying them a lot of money to come see you some people are being charged like five hundred dollars fifteen hundred dollars three thousand three hundred dollars us for for uh, in-house boarding um, if you're paying all this money you want to know what you're paying for and when it comes to these uh, evaluations and as I said yesterday uh, uh, thanks, Monica. As what I was saying yesterday was that, um, you know, you want the trainer, you want the behaviors to be able to give you a definition of something. Because what ends up happening is, for example, the behaviors will give you an actual written report, and then that becomes somewhat a uh, Fifth Amendment issue in the sense, uh, you know, in the States. It becomes that issue of incrimination, and that incrimination goes against uh, your dog's future. So you always want to be careful about that part. But the biggest thing that you do want is when you are talking to somebody, when you are actually um, having a discussion with the trainer and the behaviors, you want to know what the issue is with your dog. You don't want to, when the next time they say, you know, your dog is reactive. Okay, why is my dog reactive? Well, your dog is reactive because your dog is scared of other dogs. Okay, well, why is my dog scared of other dogs making my dog reactive? Well, your dog is scared of other dogs and it's making him reactive because your dog is uh, afraid of other dogs. Okay, so can we get off the crazy circle train and can you tell me the definitive aspects of it? Why my dog is reactive to other dogs, etc., etc. And it comes down to the aspects of dependency, as I've always said, is that dogs are overt codependents. Humans are covert codependents. We have that uh, cohabitation that goes on that scientists talk about 10,000 years etc etc in regards to cohabitation that cohabitation only occurs in dogs that are domesticated 
wild, stray, etc. dogs are not domesticated, nor do they understand the cohabitation aspect of it. And even a dog that is domesticated, if they are strayed and they become generational in the aspect of their, uh, their you know, offspring three generations down, the dog ends up losing any aspects of domestication throughout its, uh, its genetic hereditary aspects, blah, 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 blah. So in other words, it just, you got to understand what things are happening. And um, when it comes to cohabitation, the dependency issues that happen in a dog are interdependency, interdependency, and codependency. The most that we always want is to have our dog being codependent in a healthy aspect. Not the crazy stalker that <laughs> follows you all over the place and follows you up. Like, you know, yes, your dog is Velcro true you, to you. You go to the bathroom, your dog is there. You go to the bedroom, your dog is there. But we want a healthy codependency where your dog has the ability to be somewhat able to uh, be autonomous, even if it's within the home, but your dog is not glued to you if you go off to the bathroom, etc. And so understanding those dysfunctions that occur when there's some sort of deficiency in those types of dependencies is what ends up being able to determine why your dog is aggressive or reactive. And then also the other dysfunctions, the, the, the aspects of confidence, self-confidence, self-esteem, self-worth, um, you know, extroverted or introverted in that sense of the dog's behavior. By understanding those aspects of it, then you understand why your dog is reactive. And if your dog has been attacked on leash by another dog, of course your dog is going to be fearful. I talked about that three or four episodes ago in regards to your dog being attacked on leash and you're not able to protect your dog. Your dog feels betrayed that you did not protect them, which is the similar part of walking with friends. Someone comes up and beats you up only and your friends just stand there watching and you're saying to yourself, my friends, I am never ever going to trust again to protect me because they just stood there and let me get beat up. So it's that part of dealing with the dog's reactivity, etc. And you know, I just don't want to go too much detail on it, but uh, so one of the things, um, you know, one of the things that we talked about today, because it was a, a group session, um, and I'm just going to scroll down here, my notes here, uh, and, and and that is about, uh, actually, maybe I'll get to that. Hmm. Okay, they're both going to be interrelated, and because I'm so organic, wildly organic, I'm going to jump back and forth on it, and some of you trying to pay attention at home, you're going to be like, ah, that James guy. Um, so, uh, the two topics that I'm saying about is the psychology of buying the perfect leash. And the second topic is avoiding other dogs creates distrust. So I'm going to talk about other avoiding other dogs creates distrust because that seems to be such a um, uh, a confused explanation by by my 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 colleagues by my peer, peers, and, and that aspect is that you've been told that if your dog is reactive to other dogs or people, avoid those other people, or was I say other dogs, okay? So if your dog is af uh, afraid of other dogs or reactive to other dogs, then some people, some 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 of my colleagues will say to you, "Well, if your dog is afraid of other dogs or reactive to other dogs, next time you see a dog coming, turn away, walk away, or step to the side, leave the area, avoid the other dog that your dog is reactive to." And so, the explanation essentially is. Your dog is afraid of something, so we take the fear portion away from your dog by avoiding that fear, which is the other dog. And that doesn't work because your dog never learns. Your dog never learns to even appreciate or understand the environment that they're in. Your dog does not learn. The reactive dog, the aggressive dog, does not learn that it's okay to see the other dog. And in actual fact, what happens, which is the same as I was saying uh, uh, late, uh, early last week, was that one dog that was attacked by three other dogs over uh, the dog's nine years of life, because the dog feels betrayed. Your dog got attacked, he's reactive, etc., whatever, he's reactive to other dogs, he's afraid. It's whatever it comes down to. The dog, nine times out of ten, your dog, the reactive dog, is not aggressive. What your dog is doing, what the reactive dog is doing, is being fearful of being attacked. Your dog is fearing being attacked. Your dog doesn't understand death. 
and that's another topic as well. It's a bit more deeper in that sense of how the dog processes in regards to uh, the, 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 the aspects of being finite uh, and so forth like that. And again, like I say, is, you know, some other time. Uh, but so your dog is afraid of being attacked. That's essentially it. Just like the bully in the schoolyard or the trolls that troll me, they're afraid of getting attacked. And when they get attacked, they back off, right? They run away. They, they do that, all that stuff. And then you realize, oh, that bully, those trolls were just chickens anyways. Your dog is being very brave and reactive, being defensive by being offensive, by going after those other dogs, by saying, stay away from me. If you come near me, I'm going to tear your head off or tear your effing head off. Uh, and, and you're like, oh my gosh, my dog's crazy. The, the, your, the trainer, the other trainer, the other behaviorist who's inexperienced is going to say, yes, avoid that. Because what it is, is they don't know what to tell you what to do. And they don't know how to explain to you how to address the dysfunction that your dog has. Nor have sometimes they, have the in, they, they lack the insight to understand what the issue is specifically to your, go, your dog's dysfunction of either insecurity, fear-based, which is, again, the insecurity, the low self-esteem, the distrust, etc., etc., etc. But when you do turn away from the other dog, you're saying to your dog, your reactive dog that's already afraid of the other dog, I can't protect you. And I'm running away too. I'm fleeing the scene. I'm running away with you because... If they're not, they're not afraid of you, and if they're not afraid of me, we can't protect each other from the most dangerous looking 20 pound dog. Uh, but if you know the other dog is mean and his owner can't control his dog, okay, well, we'll get that in a, in a bit, Mary. And I, and I, I read your uh, comment um, last night, and you know, um, my condolences, um, I, I know, but um, you know, I, I just want to extend that to you um, on a humanistic level. Uh, okay, so um, again, when you turn away from the other dog, you're telling your dog there's nothing you can do to protect them. And there's nothing you can do to protect yourself either. So that's why not only is your dog wanting to go to the mat no matter what, right, fight to the death because of the codependency. You see that? You're also saying to your dog, again, I cannot protect you, so I'm running away, and that's why. We both need to run away because me, the human, your parent, can't protect you. And like what John Pollock had said in his me uh, private message to me, and he said it's okay to speak publicly about it, was, you know, the wolf pack, there's always an alpha pack, an alpha pair, boy, girl, mom, dad. Parenting. So when we say to our child, we can't protect you, it's you're scared. You know, how many times have you tried to get your uh, your child into the swimming pool where you're teaching them how to swim and they can't touch the bottom and immediately your child gets scared, oh my, my, my right? And they get freaked out and they're scared and, there's, and, and, and what do you say? Trust me, trust me, I'll walk you through. But if you took your child who's getting scared and scared and scared and I don't want to be in the water and you pick up your child and take him out of the water, helicoptering, right, over coddling, you take him out of the water, then what does your child say? Well, next time that happens, I'm just going to freak out. So I don't have to go in the water because I can't handle that type of confrontation on a mental or emotional or logical uh, process. With the dog, because they're logically and emotionally driven, their emotions overtake their logic aspect of processing. Because logic-wise, the dog sees your they, your, our, our, your dog sees the re the other dog, and logic is well we won't react because there's not really anything there yet. Whereas the emotional side of your dog says. I don't care if there's nothing to be worried about. I'm scared and I need to attack to defend myself so that the other dog doesn't come after me. And let's face it, that dog that's your reactive dog that's rah, 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 it does not matter. You're rah, rah. The minute you let go of your dog, even if he's going to lose, he's still going to run off after the other dog. You can have a Chihuahua running after a Great Dane or a Boston Terrier running after a Great Pyrenees. Pound for pound, the, the bigger dog it can literally take that little dog in the, their mouth and, and fatally injure the dog, the smaller dog. So that's, for our reactive dog, doesn't matter. They're afraid. But they're still going to fight to the death, even though they don't know what death means to them. So when you avoid, when you turn away, when you go off the, the, the trail, when you go off the sidewalk into the grass, when you go anywhere off to avoid... 
you're not doing anything than other uh, than than abdicating your parental ability to keep your dog, aka your child, your dog, safe from the threat that's out there. And then your dog goes, I can't trust my human on anything now. For that little, that thing is danger. And so why your dog gets reactive as well. So the, the big question is, well, why does my dog get reactive when my dog is down, the other dog is down the block, right? Five, six, seven houses away, you can barely see the other dog. And my dog sees it and my dog starts freaking out and goes after the, uh, and wants to go after the other dog is yanking on the leash and all that stuff. The reality, because dogs process via abstract memory, they don't gauge time as per se, they gauge it in slides, in slivers of consciousness, of memory. So then what ends up, your abstract memory, time, etc. blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what ends up happening is to your dog, and I have to put this in a human analogy, otherwise people don't know what I'm talking about. To your dog, your reactive dog, seeing the other dog seven, eight houses away, you know, five, six hundred feet away, 200, 300 meters away, to your dog, that dog that's that far away is only two and a half to four seconds away. Because if they run, that's how fast they will get together. So to your dog, not being able to process time or velocity targeting, which is another phrase that I, I, I've determined in regards to why some dogs get hurt. and etc. Anyways, so what ends up happening is your dog doesn't see anything other than the immediacy of the other dog down the block. If your dog can see it, and knows that the timeline, because again, if you were to walk further away, uh, sorry, if you were, were to work, walk further away from your dog, uh, from the other dog, your reactive dog starts to kind of calm down, like, oh, okay, well, right, the dog's far away, I don't have to worry about it. And even if, even if the other dog is there, and you're still continuing walking towards the other dog, and the owner who might go, oh, shoot, I have a reactive dog, or you have the people who are like, oh, I hope that crazy dog doesn't eat my little dog, and then they turn away and they walk away, right? And so your dog goes, oh, you're afraid of me. So next time I do this, it'll work again. It'll work again. Anyways, just a few layers specific to the dog, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, as uh, I'm trying to get this into a thought process, is don't avoid the other dog. Don't avoid the people. Even if the person's across the street, you get down. And for those of you who have worked with me and from the group session today and, and past clients, you get down and you reset with your dog and you bring that calming tone with them. You bring that calming voice, the voice key, you find your bot, your dog's uh, joy spot. You find those aspects where your dog feels secure. And in the beginning, your dog is going to be really reactive. You know, don't hold me, etc. Right. I've talked about dogs love being hugged. So what ends up happening is you do the reset with your dog and you bear with it and you, you get yourself quite the workout. But then your dog realizes the danger is not there. Your dog realizes it's not that bad. And if you're firm with your voice, with your dog, with your voice key, if you're firm with your voice, your dog will understand that there's no strain in your own conversation with them, that they don't hear you straining and getting upset. Because if you get upset, makes your dog even more upset in the sense that your dog then understands, uh-oh, my owner, my my parent, my 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 family, my my person that's protecting me is already stressing out because I can hear it in, in his voice. So you want to keep that calmness in your tone when you're doing, uh, doing your reset with them. You want to be able to stay in the position where you are when the other dog is coming. And for those of you who can control your dog, who's a bit smaller, etc., or, you know, if you have a muzzle on them, what you will do is you're going to hold on to your leash and we talk about the leash aspect, and I'll, I'll go on on that and again in a little bit. But you're going to hold on to your leash firmly, and you're going to walk your dog past. And you're not going to spaghetti it, and you're not going to, like, uh, you know, all over the place. You're going to firmly hold the leash in your hand and walk your dog through. And if your dog starts bouncing at the other dog and trying to go whatever, you know. And, you, and this is good to obviously practice with friends, dogs who are pretty cool. And as long as you guys are making sure that the leash is uh, new or, you know, strong and secure, not broken, the collar is secure and it's not going to break off or slip out, then you can start practicing things like that. And again, you want to do it in a bit more closer proximity than you would you know, normally because then that puts you in a different mindset because you're like, okay, I'm right here. I don't have a way to avoid this. I might as well just do it. 
So uh, again, you don't want to avoid the other dog because it tells your dog that you can't protect them. And let's face it, if you can't trust somebody, right? Like I was saying before, you lend your friend $20 and they don't pay you back for a week and they don't pay you back for two weeks and then a month later they haven't paid you back but you see them on Facebook and they're out you know, at some ski resort partying it up. And you're like, dude, you owe me 20 bucks. And you're out partying and putting it on Facebook. And every time I ask you, you got no money? What? What? And then they go say to you, oh, you know, my friends took me on. They paid for everything. Like, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. You, you, nobody goes to a bar with no money. So that's that part. And you realize, and you go, okay, my friend's been lying to me. So you would never trust your friend again with a $20. And it's only 20 bucks. But that's how thin the trust is when it comes to somebody who violates it. Same thing when your friends are standing there as you get your butt kicked by some crazy psycho stranger on the street and they don't do anything to, to defend you. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't trust them. Put yourself in your dog's mindset and that's what happens. And that goes back to understanding how to, to define what reactivity is in particular circumstances and then taking the psychological aspect, the psychogenetics of that dysfunction, of that reactivity, and bring it down to the root aspect of what that dysfunction is. Is it insecurity? Is it distrust? Is it betrayal? Is it uh, uh, high codependency? Is it interdependency? What is it? Is it modular or non-modular interdependency? What are the causes? And then when we understand that, then we go, oh yeah, now it makes sense. Now I know why my dog is like this because my dog is insecure or my dog is unsecure or my dog doesn't trust me to protect him etc 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 so um that's a that's uh, uh that's the thing okay so the other part then what we want to do is uh talking about the psychology of buying the perfect leash the psychology of buying the perfect leash and i had to kind of figure out how to say that in the right way and um i'm just gonna have a sip of water here so i don't start laughing but <laughs> I want to apologize to, to people who read the title and somebody made a comment on it today. Uh, so I want to apologize to the people who read the title of my uh, my broadcast from last night. And um, I'll read you the title and then, you know, because I, I, I wasn't thinking anything of it. Um, I just wanted to make it arrange it so people would be kind of like, what is it that people really want to know about their dog's behavior or how to do recall, etc.? So it's basically, you know, when your dog's running off somewhere and you call them back, recall, right? So, um, so somebody, sorry, uh, let me find this because I have the super slow uh, 10 and a half year old computer that uh, my ex-girlfriend gave me. So I'm still struggling with this one. Um, uh, let me just see here. Because, I mean, I, you know, most people don't use their desktop. But yeah, so uh, October 4th, episode 10. Um, and by uh, Heather Amos, Amos. Um, she, she writes down Heather and you know, uh, thank you so much. Ha ha ha. Uh, you, you, Heather writes now, you might want to rethink the title unless you want to be mistaken for porn. So the title of my heading is, uh, October 4th, 2009, well, October 4th, 19, uh, number 10, making your dog come, watching your dog pee. So, you know, I'm sorry for those of you who, uh, misinterpret it. It wasn't meant to do like that. Um, you know, maybe the only person that'd be interested in watching your dog pee would be maybe Donald Trump, but then we'd have to talk to Putin about it and see where that goes. So, uh, you know, again, I, I want to make sure that the title is a little bit more <laughs> clear next time. Oh, oh, and actually to answer Mary, your question, uh, if you know the other dog is mean and the owner can't control his dog, then what you want to do is uh, you want to talk to the other owner as he's approaching and saying, if your dog is like that, then you need to address it. Because the last thing you want is for someone else's dog to screw up your dog. And if you have to be a jerk about it, then be a jerk about it. And say it in a firm, loud voice. Don't strain. Don't scream. Don't get stressed. You say it in a voice. If, you're, if you can't control your dog, please don't walk by or please control your dog, or please make sure you have control of your dog, etc. And a lot of times people will say, oh, you know what, when I start talking in a different voice, my dog starts listening to me, or my dog starts to calm down. And that's what you want 
is to be able to show your reactive dog that you're controlling the situation even if the other people can't because you're speaking on behalf of your dog and yourself. You see that down at the dog park sometimes when you see two dogs off leash at the dog park and they get into a fight and people are screaming and yelling and yeah and then what ends up happening some guy or some girl goes up and goes stop and the dogs are like what the heck and then they break them up and that's what ends up happening uh actually and a segue here as well is if you see two dogs fighting at the dog park etc and how many people have uh, attempted to stop two dogs fighting you can get injured unless your dog knows you you're going to get attacked because your dog doesn't know who's touching them. And if your dog's not familiar with uh, uh, being touched during high levels of, uh, of uh, engagement, your dog will turn and thinking that you're trying to attack them, even though they don't know who you are, and then you get bitten and all that. Um, I've had that happen to me. Uh, and, and like I say, it's very painful sometimes to get bitten. But what ends up happening is when the two dogs are fighting, what you want to do to separate them especially if they're bigger dogs. Okay, so, so with the smaller dogs, you can stick your fingers into their jaw, into that, right? Just like a human being. And you put it in there and you press into it. And if you have to do, if you can get your hands around it, if you can't, and just put your thumbs into it, into your dog's, uh, your dog's thing. You want to avoid the other dog because the other dog, since he doesn't or she doesn't know you, may react adversely to you. And then possibly attack you and, and that can happen so with your own dog if they're familiar with you you just put it in there or you put it in there if you can do it uh, with the bigger guys like uh, like the Great Danes and Mastiffs their heads and their mouths are two to three times the size of mine um, and obviously yours you'll want to as well um, try to get them apart and if you can't get these guys apart that big and when Great Danes fight they move furniture they are just things are being smashed all over the place i had a baby grand piano it weighs like seven eight hundred pounds and, and when i had a couple of them go after each other they're moving the piano and it's stuck on three legs on the ground and they're still and i can barely move it and they're moving it and they don't even feel it and they're just slamming into it they don't even feel it and they're just smashing everything the furniture's all over the place because their bodies are so huge. I mean, 150, 200 pound, well, 150, 180, 200 pound dogs, even 150 pound dog dig in power is two to three times their weight. So a 150 pound dog is going to be generating upwards of 450 pounds minimum, but even more so because they're even irate and they're really focusing on it and they're going to be generating significant strength, moving furniture, disrupting the entire decor of your home. So how do you break them up? And especially when my guys get into a fight with each other when they used to, right, right in the beginning, I have to break them up. I have to step in between them. And because I have a control and a relationship with each dog, regardless if it's a new dog that is male reactive and dog reactive, they still understand that I'm not out there to hurt them, even though I'm afraid that they're going to attack me. I am still going to step in, and usually I just step in between them anyways. Uh, if you look at the video of Lincoln, or formerly known as Silas, uh, Lincoln the Great Dane and uh, Walter the Great Dane, you'll see that I'm in the middle, I have them on retractables, I'm in the middle of them as they're about to engage in it. And if you watch the video, you'll see this incredibly gorgeous predatorial play between the two of them. It's not like the play fighting that you see with just regular dogs that are happy or even dangerous reactive dogs. The predatorial behavior of play between two dogs that are extremely antisocial is significantly gorgeous to see. It is watching two wild animals, two primal animals go after each other. And it is just absolutely gorgeous to see the behavior. You can see it uh, in the video. Like I said, I'll put the tag in there. Uh, the video where Walter, the Harlequin, and Lincoln, the Fawn, Dane, go after each other. You can see the way that Walter approaches the fight, the play, as they are negotiating their behavior. And that's the thing. Dogs aren't just reactive. And when they growl at you, etc., they're negotiating with you. Rules of engagement. And I'll get into that some other time. And like I said, that's a much deeper psychological 
uh, um, affectation of the dog in a more of a submerged aspect of their psychology and their behavior because they're, they're the predators. And when I actually said that in my group today, I told them the predatorial dog from a severe abuse aspect um, generally turned out to be a much more intelligent dog because of the multifaceted aspects of uh, emotions they've gone through. Um, their emotional functionality has been affected in, in all the degrees from what a cute puppy to I absolutely want to kill you and beat you to death, a uh, horrible human being doing that to, to a dog. So they go through the whole, whole aspect of it. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, let me just get back to this part here. Um, I can't even remember what it was I was just saying. I just kind of went off on that part. But when you see the two predatorial dogs going after each other and they're playing in that, just watch that with Walter and with uh, Lincoln. It's just gorgeous. And you see the behavior. And you see the way that Walter snaps his jaw. It's just absolutely gorgeous. It's predatorial. And the dance that they do, you see the confrontational aspects between the two of them. It's just absolutely gorgeous because it's predators. And that's the same type of behavior that I've been confronted with. Not just with Walter, but with Lincoln, where they're right in front of me. They're waiting to attack me, and it's really quite scary and everything like that. But it's still, I have to be so respectful and amazed of the gorgeous brilliance of such a predatorial animal. Um, and I was explaining to the group today is when you look at them and you see their eye contact with each other, it's just gorgeous. It's like seeing a lion about to kill uh, its prey. And that's how these dogs get to be when they're at that high level of... Um, uh, behavior. So uh, when the two dogs are fighting with each other, and they're bigger dogs, German Shepherds, right, you know, mid-sized dogs like German Shepherds and all that stuff, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever, right, there's just, you know, dogs under 100 pounds or, or what I call uh, mid-sized dogs and all that stuff. Okay, Marge, I'll do that. Um, so it's mid-sized dogs. Uh, yeah, and I'll get to the leash thing about buying the perfect leash uh, psychologically. So what ends up happening is when you see these two dogs fighting, what you do is you take the bottom of your foot, the heel of your foot, okay? So the heel of your foot and with your knee behind your heel and you hit them in the hip. But you don't hit them in the front hip or the front shoulders. You hit them in the back hips. And you don't smash it to hurt them. You smash it to push them out of the way. Because when you're doing it to push them out of the way, you're disrupting their stance. You're, you're disrupting their behavior. You know, I know people say pick up the dog by the back legs and all that stuff. My dogs, you can't do that because you pick them. If I pick them up by the back leg, if I was foolish enough to pick up a dog like that by the back legs, they will turn and they will attack me. And they will not stop. So it's okay for just regular dangerous dogs, predatorial dogs will take you as the enemy regardless and they will turn and they will attack and they will attempt to kill. And it's not to hurt, they will attempt to kill because that's what they're trying to do with the other dog. They're not out there. Because if you watch predatorial dogs attacking a dangerous dog or a regular dog, they don't just attack. They are out there to break the spine. They are out there to debilitate. They are out there to disable. They are out there to destroy their target whether or not they eat their target, they're out there to completely, critically, if not mortally injure their target. So there's a difference between a dangerous dog and a predatorial dog. The predatorial dog wants to kill. So it's a bit of a difference here. So when you, again, when you see the two dogs fighting, the bigger dogs, if you can't get the jaw, even the, the I've had it where I'm always like trying to grab on, even with the Danes, and I'm like, holy cow, my hands are getting tired. Uh, and I can't actually close this hand because uh, I got bitten by Finnegan from Sarah Dogs um, uh, a few years ago, so I can't really close my hand anymore because uh, his handler didn't have a proper hold on him at the time, years ago. But you want to, again, use a heel so that you have your knee physics straight down. So you bring your knee up and you push down and you push down quickly, but not to hurt, not to break. You don't want to dislocate their hips. You don't want to dislocate anything that, or, or to injure them. You want to make sure you hit them in the hips. You want to make sure you hit them in the bone, not in the soft, in the organs, or anything like that. And again, you hit them in the hip, and you want to not smash them. You just want to make sure that you slowly, relatively slowly, make contact, and you push them out of the way. And then at the same time, stop! 
Stop. Because you're not upset. Even though you're freaked out. Because if your dog, your dangerous or predatorial dog does injury, then you're looking at a two, three thousand dollar bill and blah, 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 blah. Right. And then you're just down the toilet. Because, um, like, you know, people talk about pit bulls and they have the locking jaw, which is just a misnomer. But the predatorial dog, in that sense of it, when they hold on to another dog, they're holding on. And, it, you know, from the third party, second party perspective, it's absolutely gorgeous to see. I got to be a bit of a predator myself in that aspect of, of the wolf. I follow these things because I have to observe them. And if you start observing, you'll see how gorgeous it is when they do that from we being the apex predator ourselves, humans, apex predators, is seeing this type of primal action. Um, uh, but anyhow, getting back to that thing, I just, just absolutely, just it's just gorgeous. Um, but again, full force, physics-wise, push, quickly push onto the back of the hips. You don't want to do it in the front because there's a couple things you don't want to do it in the front because if you do it in the front, they might turn and see you about to, about to kick them, right? Push, kick them. They're about to see, they might see you, your dog or the other dog, and they might come and turn on you. And, I, and again, I'm speaking from the aspect of dealing with predatorial dogs, not your simple dangerous dogs, not even your uh, aggressive dogs. Your aggressive dogs are just whatever. But uh, to the predatorial dogs, to the extremely dangerous dogs, if they see you trying to approach them to do that, they may turn and attack you and then you're screwed. And then what sometimes happens is the other dog becomes part of it and they both go after you. So you have to be really careful about that because it's pretty freaky. Then you end up smoking a big joint because you want to relax afterwards because it's really freaky. Um, and the other part too is you don't want to hit them in the front shoulders. You don't want to hit them in the face because again, if they've got a grip on the other dog and you hit them in the front shoulders, you can cause even more damage as their teeth close as their teeth close in harder and harder as you pull, you know how, you know what I mean, like it's big and then the teeth get tighter and tighter. So like the locking jaw on the pit bull. So what ends up happening is that you can actually cause even more damage with their teeth tearing away from the skin and so forth like that. So it can be quite specific. So again, hit them in the back. A lot of times it upsets and they're like, what the heck's going on? And then they're like, okay. And if you're just calm about it, they're like, oh, whatever. But that also entails that the other owner is being active, proactive in, in addressing it with their own dog at the same time. It doesn't help if they're not, because then your dog's like, I'm still getting attacked. You kick me off, I'm getting attacked. And the other dog comes after them and then it gets even more brutal. So you want to make sure that that's the case. Um, so I should also say, disclaimer, don't do anything unless you feel safe. Do not risk your personal safety because if you get turned on, if you don't know what you're doing, you slip and fall, etc., you will get attacked might get attacked, but I'd rather say you will get attacked or a high risk of getting attacked. Otherwise, um, you could get really injured anyways. And I don't want to see anybody get hurt. And then people complaining to me, oh, James, I did this and that. Um, oh, was it safe? If it's not safe, don't do it. If you feel that um, um, you're, 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 you know, anyways, I'm not going to go into that point. Okay, so um, uh, Mary, I hope that answered your question in regards to the other person having a reactive dog, if that's the case, and you just basically say, dude, take care of your dog. If you can't, make sure you go ahead and walk by. And that's what I've, I've done that too. And I've got these giant dogs, and they're like rearing up and down, and people are freaking out. And I said, just walk by, just walk by, just walk by. And my dog's like, rah, 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 and I'm, and I'm right? just, just go, just go. Yeah, it's okay, just go. And then the dog walks by, and then your dog's like, ah, right? And then eventually, over time, your dog realizes, yeah, you know what? If I start freaking out, my, my dad's going to just hold me and not let me freak out. And this is kind of a waste of time. What we do is we negate that third, that middle man, that middle thing, that middle reaction, which is the reactivity and the aggression. We, we eliminate that. Um, Mars says, why do neutered dogs want to hump other dogs? And do you have suggestions to make them stop? Um, okay, so uh, that, that humping aspect of it, because they think it's funny. And a lot of times that happens too, and, and I've, I've got a topic on that, which uh, I've uh, got in my uh, little topic book thing. Um, sometimes they do it because they think it's funny. Because a lot of times a dog will just jump up on the other dog on the side, right? Like, you know how they all, they jump up on top of each other and all that. Um, not the play ball, which some idiotic uh, video on BBC was totally wrong about it. Um, the play ball is not, I'm, I'm playing with you. The play ball is actually a jab 
that's happening. Anyways, another storyline, another time. So what ends up happening is the dogs sometimes jump up on each other and think it's funny. And then, of course, a nat natural sexuality occurs with the dog. Just like my title, <laughs> Making Your Dog Come. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to change it because then I'm like, oh, no, nah, then I feel stupid. But um, uh, I'm not sure what that means, Mary. But um, so, again, they'll jump up on top of each other, etc. And then the natural inclination happens. The other thing, too, is... People say, you know, my dog doesn't like being humped, etc., etc. And what that is, is your dog's not familiar with being touched by the back end, by being scratched, being, you know, tickled, etc., etc. They have a sensitivity because they're not normally touched that way. Because when the dogs play with each other, their nose, face, head first, shoulders, paws, front paws, codependency. You remember that pawing at your codependency in one of my other vlogs? So then they're used to that, but they're not used to the behavior behind. Which is, again, going back to what we're talking about, that's why you hit the dog in the back with a push kick in the back as well because they're not familiar and it's safer. So the dog is not used to that when it comes, to, again, to the jumping on the humping on that. You basically walk over and you just walk your dog off the person. You just take your dog off the other dog and you just say, stop it. You don't make a big deal of it. You don't get angry. You don't get upset. You don't say, oh, I'm embarrassed, whatever. It's, it just ha it happens all the time. And, um, you know, I mean, we, we can't say anything about it. I mean, look at like what what uh, what uh, Mary Crawford said, you know, oh, no, not Mary, uh, somebody else said, right, you know, it's porn, the porn's all over the place. So why even apologize for it? Like, you know, uh, the Europeans, uh, Europeans have this incredibly fresh, always fresh perspective about sex, right? It's it, no big deal. They don't care. It's normal human nature same thing when you see your dog doing that or your dog is getting humped you just just stop it you know stop it that's all like any other uh, uh unwanted behavior stop you don't make it a big deal then they don't think oh okay if i do this i get a different type of attention which then happens from a dog that has interdependency issues and then you're dealing with with the art of it as well, then it's even more deeper on the psychosomatic aspects of uh, the behavior um and if your dog is humping other dogs because they think it's funny or it's a sexual aspect of that, you just do the same thing. You walk up to them and they'll go, like, ah, and, and if you don't make it a big deal, they don't run away afraid. And then the next time they do it again and again and again, if you just go, stop it, whatever, and you walk them off and, everything, and you don't make a big deal. And when you take them off, you just go, good boy or good girl, thank you for listening, good boy. And they go, oh, this, uh, oh, okay. And then we go back to that part of bringing our dog back in for affection. You, like, the people who have been following my vlogs for the last like 10, 11 days, if you're watching every single one of them, everything I'm talking about comes into the same full circle again, into these simplistic aspects of dog psychology, right? That's why I say so brilliant, the simplicity of dogs. Everything I'm talking about comes to the same circle over and over again, back to the same point aspect of codependency. Uh, so when you do that with your dog, he's being a goofball, you just basically walk him off, etc., etc. Uh, maybe one day I'll talk about why dogs pee on top of other dogs pee. Why do dogs stop everywhere and pee all the place? And why do dogs pee in certain strategic locations as well, right? And that's a tracking aspect of it. And why do some dogs squat when they pee? I talked that, uh, about that in my group session today. Why some like male dogs will squat um, and uh, female dogs will lift their leg and all that stuff. It's a, not an aspect of, uh, uh, I mean, it's m mimicking. It's it's. Uh, um, um, you know, the affectation within the, the group itself, etc. Yeah, you know, when people, uh, Mars, you agree, uh, you wish other people would walk their dog off and stop them from humping? Because most times those people are just like, oh, yeah, on their cell phone or they're talking to each other. Ah, la, 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 la. You know, your dog's humping. Yeah, he'll stop. La, la, la. You're like, dude, what is wrong with you? Your dog is rude. Your dog is rude. You want some dog manners. Tell your dog to stop humping. If not, then walk over calmly to your dog and just interrupt him and pull him off. Because you notice that when you're doing that, uh, over you to go to stop your dog, and your dog's like, ah, and they're like trying humping, and then you run, and the person runs over, and the dog runs away, and then you they walk away, and then the dog goes back again five, ten seconds later doing the same thing again. Because your dog is like, oh, I got in trouble. Well, I get my owner to stop by running away, and then he, my owner leaves, and I just go back and start humping again. If you just make it no big deal, like, just stop. And you walk over and you just stop. Just stop. And you walk them off. Just stop. Thank you. And just like I did with Minky, thank you. Like yesterday or the other day when I have um, Minky with the other two dogs that are extremely resource guarding. And Minky's growling at them, as you can hear on that. And it's real live, live 
right? Everything I talk about, I can prove it 100% of the time. Minky's yelling at them by going, and he's getting ready, getting ready, and the other two dogs are getting closer and closer, and they're like this far away right here. And I just said, stop it, Minky. You know, and I tell them to stop, and they stop. Same thing when Lincoln is on the uh, uh, last night when he's barking out the window. What did I say? Lincoln, stop yelling. Stop yelling. And then I'm watching his timing and I'm interrupting his timing before he starts to yell. We can tell because the dog's about like this. The mouth starts to open. We just tell him to stop. And that's it. And we go, thank you. If someone does something for us, a little tiny thing, we say thank you to them. If we ask somebody, hey, can you give me a glass of water? Even if they're a waiter, right? You know, the service industry, they go get you a glass of water and they bring it to your table. What do you say to them? Thank you. Say to your dog, have respect for your own dog. If your dog is, you're asking your dog to comply to your order, show them respect. Show your dog respect and say thank you. Creates a conversation. Maintains the codependency. Do you see? Like, that's why I say everything I'm talking about is such a simple aspect of it. It's not some crazy convoluted thing. And that's why it escapes psychology and dog psychology and academia and Temple Grandin has no idea because they don't understand what's going on because they just think the dog is dumb and stupid and the dog takes food as a treat, as a motivation for compliance. But in reality, food doesn't exist in the canine species at all as a communication device. But again, the, the human arrogance... The anthropomorphization of human arrogance, of expectation. If the dog doesn't comply to the food, because we say the dog is supposed to comply to the food, then that dog doesn't comply and is still reactive. That dog is broken, so we either medicate the crap out of that dog or we say your dog should die. Behavioral euthanasia. One of the weakest aspects ever they can get. And I think that, uh, I mean, that uh, I got kicked out of the reactive... Reactive and aggressive dog group uh, run by Erica Eden because I said behavioral euthanasia is a useless, well, I didn't say useless, I said it is a weak argument for inexperience. And of course, all these trainers and these behaviorists that have these incredible reputations and like, oh, like I, I got 4,000 people following me and then they, they're on my, my page here. And, and, and I'm like, I don't, you know what? I don't really care. I just want to make sure that. People understand the, the clarity of things. I'm not concerned about my followers. I'm not concerned about my ego. I'm concerned about protecting the dog. And when you say stupid things like behavioral euthanasia, it's the, who's ever heard of behavioral euthanasia? You're killing a dog for the behavior. I love this rant that I go off on all the time. Um, so this behavioral euthanasia is absolutely the weakest aspect of human uh, uh, abdication of responsibility. Euthanasia is a medical term to put out of misery due to medical pain, suffering, etc. Behavioral is just behavior of the dog. The dog is this way. So instead of killing the dog because of the behavior, let's fix the problem. Let's address the psychological aspect. Going back again to the same part of why is my reactive dog doing this or generalizing terms, we got to be specific about what's going on. We've got to have the definition that explains the psychology of the dog instead of the general dogs reactive um okay so uh mary said i i was lead training my puppy i'm not sure what le leash oh leash train all right sorry you're, you're in a different country uh i was lead training my puppy when this guy came up with his mean dog and the guy was drunk i grabbed my puppy and ran away i told him to stay away but he wouldn't so i'm i'm, I'm guessing what you mean mary is that you were leash training your your young dog and some drunken disrespectful person started walking out with their dog who's reactive which because the guy is just a total loser and then you uh, you told him to, I assume you told him not to do anything dumb and then what do they what so you grabbed your dog and ran away what I would have done in the future and I mean safety first if the guy is gonna be somewhat potentially violent to you or to your dog or unable to control the other dog you don't have any uh, any options other than to yes to avoid it uh, what you can do as well is if that dog is coming towards you, right? So you, that reactive dog and you're here and you're on the, and you're luck and you have a place to go. And the dog is reactive as you're walking with your dog and the guy's not listening to you, you can tell. Then what you will do is you will make a deliberate turn and cut the corner. Or not cut the corner, turn deliberately into an L away from that person and then 
continue onward past them on the other side of the street would be the best case for a safety issue because what happens is if you start going on an angle and you're cutting corners then you're telling your dog you're avoiding but if you actually make a deliberate change of direction your dog doesn't understand other than oh we're just going somewhere else now this is just normal for us and if you're not running away your dog's like oh okay well, this is not a big deal um all right so what i want to do is i want to talk about the uh the leash side of things leash side of things um uh, the psychology of buying the perfect leash i don't know if i'm Oh boy. Okay. I, you know, I don't have enough time to talk about the psychology of buying the perfect leash. Um, uh, I'll do that tomorrow and I might try to broadcast a little bit earlier tomorrow. Um, maybe around 7 PM, uh, Pacific standard time, the West coast of, uh, North America. Um, and then I talk about that. And when you hear the stuff about buying the perfect leash and why you need to have a proper leash control and all that stuff, you're just going to be like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> right and then those of you who worked with me you're like yeah okay james is gonna just tell us the most simplest thing it makes sense why did we never know this and why does everybody else in in the industry tell us the wrong thing and it's because nobody knows how to control the leash because they're all dealing with dogs that they're killing at 60 percent of their skills uh, of, of the dogs out there they're killing 60 percent they're i mean sorry they're proficient with only 60 percent of the dogs that are out there that are re reactive so of course, again, if you've only got experience with only 60%, but you're calling yourself one of the top 100% aspects of it, you're like, dude, your emperor's clothing is totally invisible, man. So it doesn't make sense to listen to people who don't have success with predatorial dogs because they don't know what they're talking about. They're, because they're the same people that go, I don't want to work with that dog. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm scared of that dog. So I'm not going to work with that dog. So you don't even know how that dog actually behaves anymore. Uh, the people today in my group session, there's a couple of dogs there, uh, you know, and I even say to the, say to them when I start my group session or my private session, if something happens, don't, don't react. And that is in the Axel video as well where I talk about that. Don't react. There's nothing you can do. There's no use screaming. Your dog, right? So, and I'm not talking about them attacking, being attacked by their dog. I'm talking about me getting attacked. Right? And, and if I get bitten, right, you see I have my scars and stuff like that. If I get attacked, I just say to people, don't don't yell, don't scream, don't react. Just get them off of me or get the dog off of me or I'll try to get the dog off or whatever, but there's no use. I think um, that happened to, a, I think, uh, Dozer's mom was there that one time. I think it was Dozer, uh, he, English bulldog. Um, it was in the backyard of this house here that I'm renting. And it's fence and all that stuff, and and um, you know, Dozer has a bit of a um, um, you know immaturity, so he's a little bit of an attitude. And what ended up happening is he was upset about something. I had him on leash. He was upset about something. Uh, he was reactive to all the other dogs and reactive to his own uh, foster family, etc. So what ended up happening is um, he was he was trying to get at me, and I was backing away slowly, but I didn't realize there was something on the ground behind me. So I stepped on it. I fell down. And there's like six people there, six dogs and all that stuff, right? And, and actually Craig Piddick from the, the firefighter uh, who gave me the shirt yesterday um, or from before. Uh, so I fell down on my back and I'm on the ground and the dog is coming at me to attack me to my face. He's not going after my feet. He's not going after my legs. He's going after towards my face and he's focused on me to get at me. And I have him on the leash while he's doing that because I know if I let go of the leash, there's no way to control him and that allows him to circle through and come after me and come after me because that's what his intention was. He wasn't concerned about the other people around, etc., etc. And so what ended up happening was he came at me and I'm pulling away and as I'm and I'm spinning around on the ground. So I'm spinning around as fast as I can to create centrifugal force so that way it causes uh, the dog, a uh, dozer, I think it was dozer, uh, it causes him to stay further out because he can't get a, a, a hold on me as I'm spinning around trying to get him off. And then other people came over and then they were able to get control of him as well. Uh, it was pretty frightening to begin with. But again, there's no use screaming. There's no use yelling. It's just whatever. You get attacked, you get attacked. This is just no big deal. I mean, those old days, you remember when you fell down, you got hurt like in the playground. You're like, okay, well, just, you know, I got a big bruise on my head. Well, whatever. So we want to kind of man up, human up, woman up, person up. And be a bit more uh, um, not so whiny, I guess. But I guess because of the dogs I work with. 
Um, actually, I'm going to kind of go over through something. I, I might get kicked out of this group because uh, because I'm going to do somewhat of a direct quote. I just got kicked out of another group, another dog trading group yesterday because I uh, the other day because I had expressed my opinion that you know look at the dog psychology and look at the you know like it's not reactive. The dog is da 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 and all this, and then people kind of got a little bit upset with me because I'm talking about stuff that they don't think exists in dogs. Which is that dogs have a psychological quotient, that dogs are sentient. They're like, no, the dog is dumb. So somebody basically says, you know, uh, any advice appreciated. I'm working with a, you know, uh, a, a, a one-year-old dog. I won't say what kind it is because it's quite specific here. I'm working with a da-da-da dog. And I haven't read this, so I, I just, I looked at it. And went, oh, you know, I'm going to save it for you guys. Uh, who, when excited and overstimulated, will jump grab at uh, people uh, clothing and bite shoes and shoelaces and all that stuff and uh, you know I've been able to um, I'm paraphrasing I've been able to um, you know get that to stop happening from at home uh, but when uh, my dog is elsewhere in a professional setting like you know and, and with other dogs um, uh, uh, the issue is very difficult and that um, uh, what is it? Uh, when people come into the the area, he will go after their feet and their shoes. Basically, what he was doing to her, he's now doing to everybody else, and um, that the people coming to the facility. And he will uh, he will listen to certain commands, which is the same old you know whatever sit leave it commands and all that stuff, and then go right back to the behavior again. Um, and uh, you know the person then says. Uh, we tried to, um, uh, you know, uh, eliminate anything that may have been causing the issues that he may be recognizing. We've done the things where we put him away in, a, in his kennel, etc. And then when he goes back into the facility area again, he goes back to biting and all that stuff. So what that right off the bat, and she goes, you know, any help suggests, and, and she's a, 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 she, sorry, she's a trainer. And of course, as I said the other day, the trainer doesn't have anything else to do other than their circle and bag of tricks that they keep going around and when they run out of it because it's all brute force aspects it's all human conjecture aspects of it they just keep going, oh, oh i can't do it anymore it's the same circle over and over and over again and then they run out of options because they don't know anything else they're just dog doesn't take a treat okay uh shock collar oh and why don't you just pay attention to what's wrong with your dog and understand that and then people are saying things like, you know, uh, it's because the, uh, you know, the dog going to the group situation is not appropriate and all that stuff. So then that means this person, basically this other trainer who's certified and unaccredited and all this other stuff and say, uh, you know, it's not an appropriate uh, environment. So then what will end up happening if, if this trainer listens to the other trainer, they'll remove their dog from that facility, which means that the, they won't take their dog to another daycare facility or another group facility or another off-leash park. And then that means their dog becomes even worse because then the dog no longer has any socialization because the socialization is removed. So the dog has no exposure, blah, blah, blah. The trigger stacking, all this garbage stuff in there. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like listening to children. It's like, wow, these guys are on their tricycles with two wheels. And like, why are we falling over? So, um, so, so there's that, you know, and they're like, I agree. I'm a certified trainer and all that stuff. And this is what I should, what you should do, which is exactly the same thing. Remove them from the, from the environment. It's like, yeah, okay. That's just going to make your dog even worse and all that stuff. Um, and yeah, and they said, we kept him out of daycare. Oh, so they took him out of daycare as well. And they did one-on-one -on -one training and, uh, back to the thing. And, and, um, you know, now the dog is perfect and all that stuff for this other, other trainer. But then that's a dog that doesn't have a huge dysfunction aspect of it. And then also the same part here. When they talk about one-on-one -on -one training and situations like that, they don't talk about the psychology, which right off the bat says to anybody, me, anybody, that they attempted to treat train their dog. And because they attempted to treat train their dog, this one person had success because their dog wasn't that severe. The other person who's posted has a severe issue because having been, uh, having, being a trainer... She's already tried those tricks in her little witchcraft bag, and obviously it's not working because it's a psychological issue. Why does a dog jump up? Why does a dog nip at people's feet and all that stuff? Oh my God, just so easy. It's insecurity. It's a certain level of introversion. It's a high codependency, and it is a lack of self-esteem. Da-da! That's it. That's how simple it is. 
but they don't understand this and they brute force the dog by treating the dog like property not like a living being and that's the difficult part of it this is why i mean i just i kind of it just gets me really upset because because at the end of the day it's a dog that suffers the dog gets killed etc but it's the dog that suffers the dog your dog pays the ultimate penalty that's why to me I fight so hard and I battle so hard and I get trolled viciously as I attempt to try to f change, fix the uh, archaic perspective. Again, treat training comes from Pavlov 122 years ago, 1897, when people owned slaves, when women couldn't vote. Nowhere does food exist as a communication device in the canine species at all. And I keep saying it. I challenge any trainer or behaviorist, including this PhD person or the behaviorist uh, from that Huffington Post article who still hasn't returned uh, any reply, because she even put it in there, you have questions, contact me, right? And so no return, right? Because I've refuted what she said. And they just don't understand that all they're doing has been, have been looking at dogs as property. And it just keeps going on and keeps going. Hey Tyler, how's it going? Wait till you. I, I hope you're. If you have any questions, feel free to ask before I run out. I got like twelve percent battery power now because I only had like fifty percent battery power. Um, but these are the aspects when it comes to uh, training dogs: is addressing our dogs by the psychology, the true psychology of the dog, as we would with a human being. We got a guy that is a drug addict. Why is he a drug addict? Because his mom and dad left. And, and he was an orphan, and then he went into a horrible foster care, and he was abused, and then he started stealing, and then he started getting to the wrong crowd, and he started using drugs, and then he started going out with somebody that he that uh, was uh, abusive to, or was abusive to him, and then he started, you know, changing jobs to jobs to jobs to jobs, right? I just, I, you know, this is a hypothetical person that I've just made up his background, which is very much real to a lot of people who are like that. So then we understand, we create this arc, this, this background, this history of this human being on a psychological basis. Well, yeah, you know, if the guy's, uh, his parents split up and he got put into an orphanage, well, I guess that would make him pretty upset and feel abandoned, make him feel low self-esteem, make him feel like he's unwanted. What do you think your dog feels on a rudimentary basis, right? Emotionally, and cognitively, on a rudimentary basis, how your dog's processing things. Logic, emotional, on a rudimentary basis. Their comprehension, rudimentary, it's very simple. But they're processing in lightning fast, one-tenth of a second processing time. That's what's happening. But the emotional context of the dog is a high co uh, was co over codependency. And that codependency is what we want to, to encourage, etc., etc., but we see these behaviors on the dog and then we also have to, what people don't seem to keep into context is every single dog out there is a predator. Just like human beings, we are predators. You, you know the, that book, Lord of the Flies, not Lord of the Rings, but Lord of the Flies. All of that, we are all predators by nature. Your dog is a predator. Your chihuahua is a predator. You know when you go see your dog pick up a toy and they shake it in their head and it looks cute and scorched and they throw it up in the air? They would do that with a stick. They would do that with a squirrel. What does the dog do when they grab the toy and they shake it? Just like I was talking about the two dogs fighting, the predatorial dogs, they're out there to break the spine. They're out there to physically incapacitate their target permanently. That's the predator. That's the type of dog you have. So when you see your dog playing with toys like that, and it's super cute, and I tell you, it's super cute, they're predatorial. Their intent, if given the chance in the wild, would be to kill that toy if it was alive. Why do you think they go after the squirrels? They're not out there to go, hi, I'm going to have fun. They're out there to kill the squirrel. They're out there to break the squirrel's spine. They know that. It's instinct um okay so i should end it off before I, I cut out by accident and then my phone's gonna be all screwed up and then this all get lost out uh so uh, you know i'll talk about the leash aspect of it tomorrow buying the proper leash 
And um, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. I can't, I, I'm not going to be answering them because it, it feels weird to answer while some people, have, you know, comment it while it's live. And then, and then I'm like, oh, which one is which? And then I feel guilty for not answering everybody or liking everybody's posts, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, I mean, maybe it's this guilt thing I grew up with, but I just want to make sure that people who are in trust with me are, you know, who trust me, just anyways. Um, please share my post. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. The links are in there. Please uh, please follow me on Twitter because the more people who are following me are able to spread and share my work and that means more people will learn and understand that and we collectively together as a society we can change the world for dogs. That's ultimately it. Then we can stop listening to people saying behavioral euthanasia. We can stop hearing on these ridiculously dumb statements of ineffectiveness. Just like I say about Dr. Ian Dunbar's bite level scale, you know, bite level four, bite level five, bite level six causing death. Such a dumb thing to say. It's a rhetorical scale. You see a dog kill somebody or kill a squirrel. You see the dog kill something. You don't really need a bite level scale, do you? But we're so spoon fed by the industry top personnel that that's what we follow like little fawns anyhow that's my rant just saying uh please subscribe to my channel you know why why you know just look at all the stuff i've talked about watch all the blogs uh, vlogs you'll see everything makes sense and it all circles back to the same aspect of the dog codependency uh everything like hey hey, hey, hey. um Sharon. so everything follows through it all makes sense uh the people who they're like uh you know who's this uh you know the people who have worked with me who are watching right now, you can all attest to the stuff that I've done consistent across the board. The progress has been 100% every single time. So it's not magic that I do. It's something that you have because people are doing it themselves. I teach families, parents, owners how to do it themselves. And you guys are doing it yourself. And so, um, you know, my dream is, again, to have people who are much more talented and much more skilled and much more naturally talented and gifted, much more gifted than me to come and follow in my footsteps. Maybe not in my generation, maybe not in my lifetime, but I do hope so because the sooner the more people know, the more likely the less dogs will be killed. And my ultimate goal is for dogs to be recognized as functional sentient beings to be afforded limited legal rights. Uh, and if you haven't done so, um, please sign my petition uh, to uh, ask the Canadian government to criminalize dog and cat meat. Uh, I have over 104,000 signatures right now and have Honorable uh, Member of Parliament Ken Hardy um, who is taking this to the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, he met with me already to discuss this whole aspect of it. So I'm working on the advocacy side of things. And, um, you know... I'm just one voice, so if we can do this, this would just be lovely. Uh, we could change the world for dogs. Thank you so much. Have a great Saturday night. Till we talk again. Bye bye.